Welcome everyone to a webinar in which um, Elspeth Magleton from um, University of Nebraska talks with us about regulating the final frontier that is out of space. Elf Elspeth is going to explore why the humanities, ethics and the law are vital to sp space exploration and industry development. As the NASA Perseverance rover begins exploring Mars and the Chinese rover is also about to touch down, it's relevant to ask questions about regulation of contamination of the Mars environment, for example, and questions about why we spend so much money on these missions and to what end. As Elon Musk's SpaceX company actively plans and prepares for a commercial venture for human settlement on Mars, it's relevant to ask how those settlements will be governed. As small vehicle uh, launch operators, such as Rocket Lab in New Zealand and Gilmore Space Technology in Australia, compete for customers with big and established launch operators like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, SpaceX, United Launch Alliance and Arian Sparse, how are their disputes going to be settled? As they collectively increase the number of active satellites from around 2,500 at the beginning of this decade to probably around 50,000 by the end of this decade to realize the aspirations of big telcos, new startups and university researchers. How do we balance those aspirations with the dangers of congestion? Is the US, China, Russia, Japan, the UK, France, NATO, India, and even Australia consider how to best organize their military forces to operationalize space, possibly even turn it into a war fighting domain. What are the parameters on what such military forces could, should, and must do? Out of space though is for everyone. It's, it's not just for tech savvy billionaires, superpower militaries, Gen Y startups, and real life rocket scientists. It's incredible as all of those people are and often doing great things simply because they're good things to do. Outer space is relevant to the broader public as well, no matter their nation, their education, their race, their religion, their colour, their age, their ability. Whoever we are, it's relevant to us, to our children, their children and generations to come. So there are a huge range of interests at stake. And that is the context in which regulation and ethics and the humanities are attempting to provide solutions that balance those interests. With all of this in mind, it's heartening for me personally and for, what, for others who are online as well, no doubt, to be part of the increasing interest in learning about space activities. Here at UNSW Canberra, we are in week one of a course called Space Cooperation, Conflict and Competition. Noting that those three words, cooperation, conflict and competition, offer concurrent characterizations of activities in the space domain, each of which is independently valid as a characterization, yet they do not sit entirely comfortably with one another. So I'm looking forward to questions and comments from some of my students at the end, but there are space related courses in the humanities uh, also at the University of Waikato in New Zealand at Australian National University, also here in Canberra, at the University of Adelaide, at Western Sydney University and elsewhere. And then there are legal and other practitioners and operators, and those simply with an interest in the global space community who have joined us. Wherever you're coming from, welcome. We're, we are privileged to be hearing from Elspeth Magleton virtually. Um, but for the pandemic restrictions, we may have had the opportunity to host her here in person. Um, the US Consulate General in Auckland regularly arranges a US speaker series in which it funds visits to New Zealand and Australia by US speakers. Mara Hosada Sua from the US Consulate General in Auckland, undeterred by the challenges that the pandemic's thrust upon us all, has arranged for Elspeth and others to present virtually. So a big thank you to, to Mara and the US Consulate General in Auckland. So Elspeth Magleton is the Executive Director of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Space, Cyber and tele, telecommunica, Telecommunications Law Programs, where she focuses on commercial space law and policy, cyber security and cyber crime and national security. That's a broad range of things. 
She also advises on national and international legislation for cyber and space policy, including the commercialization of space. Additionally, she's the University Law College's principal investigator for projects serving US Strategic Command's University Affiliated Research Center, the only such center in the Department of Defense to include a law school in their research partnership. Elspeth is working with NASA to develop a space law pilot program to create a nationwide network of students faculty and practitioners interested in space law and policy. Elspeth is joining us today from uh, Lincoln, Nebraska on Thursday afternoon, her time. Um, Elspeth, thank you so much for setting aside some time for us today. But before I go to you, um, for the audience, you, down the bottom of your screen, you've got the little Q&A thing. Um, if you want to put in a question, put a question in there. Um, we, I will moderate the questions at the end. You have the option of upvoting particular questions to, to indicate that it's uh, something that you think is a priority that should be answered. We won't necessarily be able to um, answer all the questions in the time available. You can also comment on other people's questions as well. So that's the place to, to put your questions. Um, but for now, um, we, we have uh, Elspeth to talk to us about regulating the final frontier. So uh, over to you, Elspeth, to take it from here. Well, thank you so much. And I wanna echo all of your thanks, of course, to everyone who's worked hard to bring me um, here to you all virtually. Uh, it hurts my heart to, you know, she said the same thing to me, which was normally in a normal year, we'd bring you here. And I thought, please bring me there. It's very cold <laughs> in Nebraska right now. Um, but maybe maybe I'll get a second turn next year. We'll see. Uh, fingers crossed for me. I, I doubt that's going to happen. But very, very grateful to be here virtually and to spend some time with all of you. Um, I have to admit, I have um, been on the Zoom basically for... I don't know, four or five hours at this point today. So I'm hoping that we can have some fun talking about all of this and, and kind of get into it. I know that there are some other space law professionals and professors that are listening in today. So a little intimidation uh, having them here, but who I'm really interested in is all of you students, right? That's, that's who we're here for. Um, and those are the kind of questions that I wanna see and answer and talk about why there's a lawyer talking to you right now about space, right? So I wanna start with some very fair questions you might be asking yourself. And I'm also leaving it up to all of you to make sure that my PowerPoint is the thing you're seeing and not my desktop photo of my beautiful daughter. So, so someone put something in the Q&A if that's not right. <laughs> I assume we're good, good. So, so here's some very fair questions that you might be asking yourself when you realize that you are going to be potentially required or asked to attend this, this talk. Um, of all of the cool things that we could be talking about, about space, they picked law, right? It's true. And I'm hopeful that at the end of this, you're going to say, you know what, that was interesting. Or maybe because you're in the classes that you're in, you already know that this can be interesting. Um, but that's a fair question. They probably couldn't get an astronaut. No, I'm kidding. I'm sure they could get an astronaut, but I'm glad they picked me and I'm really excited to be here with you. Uh, there is a space program in Nebraska. I, I am going to spend just a minute on uh, our program and about where we're located. Um, and just to give you some sense of, of who we are and why I'm the one that's here today. I think one of the key things to know about Nebraska is that we are not a place where you would launch anything. We are in the geographic center of the United States. Uh, we're landlocked by at least three states on any side to get to any, I mean, even a big lake, right? We are very much uh, in the center, and I'll explain kind of why a space program is here, but we're a relative relatively rural state um, and not a place that has a spaceport or any launch capabilities. And then finally, where we're going to spend most of our time today is about why law matters to space, right? Why do we care about what lawyers have to say when we're thinking about space missions, space activities, and how humans interact with space? All right, so the first piece, why Nebraska? I told you all these reasons why it didn't make any sense to have a space program here. Um, there might be something that you recognize in all four of these photos. And if 
you're thinking it's camouflage, you're thinking correctly. Uh, we are about 30 to 40 minutes front door to front door to US Strategic Command. And they're a major reason that we exist here in Nebraska. Um, from training officers there, to affiliated projects and research that we do with them, to their needs. Um, when the program started back in 2007 and 8, uh, we, uh, the space and the cyber mission set was still part of STRATCOM's mission set. Um, if you're aware of some of the, the U.S. structure and in terms of our Department of Defense, we now do have individual commands, the U.S. Cyber Command, um, as well as now U.S. Space Command and Air Force Space Command. Uh, but of course, STRATCOM kept its nuclear deterrence mission set and deterrence generally. And, and when it comes to assuring our allies and deterring our adversaries, space and cyber are still two major arenas that we're focused on. And so our work with them is still very, very relevant, and very much part of what we do. Our relationship to them also allows us to work very easily with Cyber Command and Space Command, as well as NORAD and some of the different Air Force bases that are also working in the space domain. So that is a huge portion of why we are where we are. You may have also heard uh, Professor Blake say that we are the space, cyber, and telecommunications program. And a lot of people question how you put those three things together. Um, in my purview, they are the three pillars of a great pyramid that leads to an attorney who thinks about these problems holistically. Um, I think these are just two great examples. You can't launch a space vehicle or operate a comm satellite without licensing your spectrum. And here in the US, we do that through the Federal Communications Commission, which is a firmly sort of telecom focused agency. Uh, cyber warfare, we're thinking about satellites as targets. Our, our space assets for all nations are critical to our economic infrastructure, right? So when we're thinking about security, we have to think about these things really broadly. Our students, of course, still specialize generally in one area over the others, but we do require some base knowledge in all three of these subjects as the technology is so intrinsically interconnected and in how all of these um, groups work together. And this is my last bit on Nebraska, I promise. Um, but I think it's important that you understand sort of who's talking at you, right, as we get into this and have a little bit of fun. So the first piece is that the majority of my students are active duty judge advocate general. So they are military JAGs, um, predominantly U.S. Air Force. We also have students from the U.S. Army, Marines, and Naval um, services that are part of our program. We are also associated with the University Affiliated Research Center. You may have heard of the phrase UARC. Um, there's 13 UARCs across the U.S. Department of Defense, and all it really means is that a combatant command or other unit within the Department of Defense has partnered with an educational or research institution and created a grant vehicle. And the terms of these are generally about five to 10 years and renegotiated at the end of that. We're on our, I think, third contract rotation. So ours has been really successful for us as one of the newer contracts within the department. Um, and what it allows us to do is to contract with the government or with the Department of Defense without having to go through competitive bidding. And it, you know, if you're familiar at all with that process, that, that's a boon right? <laughs> to get to avoid going through that piece of what we do. And it helps to enhance our relationship. Um, as Professor Blake mentioned, we're one of the only, or it's to our knowledge, the only UARC where one of the labeled core competencies of what we provide US Strategic Command comes directly from the law school. Um, figuring out how a law school fits into a traditional research model has been a challenge. We do not give them legal advice. I am not the lawyer for US Strategic Command, um, but we do analytical work for them in thinking about future issues. We're also part of several alliances between STRATCOM and NORAD, um, but military is not all we do, right? I, I, and I also don't think you can really do national security without thinking through the commercial and private sector and the effect on civilians and, and some of those concerns um, and private networks. So we do have a strong commercial focused curriculum as well um, and do a lot of work with the commercial sector here in the United States. Um, we also have a new program, the Nebraska Governance and Technology Center, where I'm also the executive director that kind of looks at space from a more, um, or not space, but technology from a more 10,000 foot view and thinking about that nexus between evolving technology and regulation and governance and, and how we legally approach technology. And then of course, um, he also mentioned our NASA space law network. So kind of a broad swath about what we do and who we are and kind of the background that we're bringing to the table on this conversation. All right, and that's cool, right? That's cool, that's cool and all. I'm sure you're all excited to learn a little bit more about Nebraska. <laughs> uh, and, and I appreciate 
uh, everyone's attention for that. But I, I also want to get to the fun part here, which is why does law matter to space? And what, what can a lawyer do to enhance space activities? And I kind of have this joke down here, you know, and other dinner party questions that I get, because if any of you have maybe experienced this, um, if you're a space law professional, or if you've told anyone in your family that you're taking a legal or ethics centric course when it comes to space, they might roll their eyes very hard and say, lawyers, why do they have to muck everything up? They're gonna go in there and they're gonna overregulate this. They're gonna kill an innovative in industry. Um, you know, why do lawyers have to get their hands around everything? And, and, and there's some fair criticism in there. But what I like to tell them is that law also has this other power, which is to support innovative industry, to help it prosper, to help it grow, and to help it do it in a way that is mutually beneficial to many, many different parties. And that is the, that is the gift of law, in my opinion. And rather than just trying to prove that to you by saying it over and over again and thrusting it down uh, your throats, I want us to think about space. And I want us to daydream. Like I said, I've been on Zoom for like four hours. So we're gonna take a little bird walk and a mental vacation and think about space and enjoy it. So all of the things we're gonna start with here are near future, right? Very near future. The technical abilities are there or almost there to do all of these things. So the one in the corner, we have um, SpaceX's Starlink, which is a small satellite constellation that's going into low Earth orbit um, that's going to provide broadband access. And, you know, I, you heard a little bit about Nebraska. I just told you we're in the middle. We're very rural. What that means is, you know, I'm in a city of almost half a million where, you know, Omaha, which is our next closest city, is about a million. But if I drive 45 minutes in the other direction, I very quickly hit a county where there's more cows than people. Right, that's where we live. And the infrastructure challenges of getting broadband access out there, not just for educational and personal uses, but also for precision agriculture, for remote sensing, for other things that we wanna be able to do, not necessarily remote sensing, but for uh, other technical things that we wanna do that require internet and data access. It's very, very difficult from an economic perspective to build out that sort of infrastructure. Um, Australia, very similar, right? You're thinking about these rural areas, very difficult to try and fund uh, fiber lines out there and then support those economically to those really small communities that are in very rural pop, uh, areas. And this is one of the things that Starlink aims to do. And there might be some of you here who are going, well, wait, but wait, there's bad things too, but we're not gonna do that yet. We're still daydreaming. We're still enjoying the future possibilities of space. So, so put, put all the, but what's, but what about on the back burner for a minute, okay? So the second picture here up at the top corner, that's remote satellite servicing. So these are robots that we can launch. They're gonna go prolong satellite life. Um, they might be able to be launched with other payloads. They might be smaller. They might be able to enter their own orbit and controllable. But the idea here is sustainability, right? We want to extend satellite life that maybe has run out of propulsion fuel or is broken in some way and can be repaired. Um, so this is an amazing piece of technology, right? NASA has a large project doing this or several private commercial ventures um, who have developed the ability to do this, right? That we can take these robots into space and repair satellites. This picture down here in the bottom corner, cleaning up space junk, right? You've probably seen gravity. We're all aware that space debris is an issue and that mitigation is a challenge. And the technology is there. We, you know, this is an image of a net, but you've also probably heard about vacuums or, or other retrieval technologies that are out there to help us clean up space. And I think that these three things are just three examples. There's so many more different things that we're doing in space. Um, but these make me full of life and full of optimism. And I think they're really interesting. So continuing on that, let's push our brains a little further into our daydream, into maybe a habitation on another planet, right? What, what, is, what does that feel like? What does that look like? What do we need to make that work? And let's think about that. And then we can push ourselves even a little bit further beyond that, right? What happens when we're beyond habitation? What do we bring with us as human beings out into this universe? Um, 10 points for anyone who can name all of the shows that these ships come from, but with the points mean nothing, but if you're a nerd, all you care about is getting points, right? But, but I, I think it's an important notion to actually talk about storytelling and talk about space a little bit in our culture, because I do think it's a place where humans start to explore some of these concepts and that has led to technological evolutions. Just one more example of how the humanities are a major part of how we think about space and how we think about science. Um, you know, you probably have all heard the stories about the flip phone on the Enterprise and Star Trek leading to actual flip phones to 
and changing how they opened them because people kept trying to flip it open like Captain Kirk did and they used to open the opposite direction, right? So all of these wonderful like, things uh, that we've taken from these stories that may help us think about space in different, unique and interesting creative ways. So, so that's all beautiful, right? I, I, at least I hope you think it is. I think it is. I think humans um, innovating interesting pieces of technology to interact with the stars is a fascinating and exciting thing. But these things are also really hard. Um, I, I already told you on, on the pictures that appear on this slide when I showed them to you the first time that the technology pretty much already exists or is nearly there. What makes all of these things so hard is people, right? Um, let, let's start with satellite servicing here, right in the top left. What is wonderful about these robots is they sustain the lives of these satellites. What's hard about these robots is they're what we call dual use technologies, which means they can be used for these excellent, peaceful, scientific, sustainability um, purposes. They can also be used to dismantle a satellite, right? So they can be used for military aggressive purposes. And so there's great concern about how we regulate these things, think about these things, license these things, how different countries are going to handle using them, who is using them, who isn't using them, right? So the, the question here about using this type of technology to prolong satellite life and mitigate the amount of space debris we're leaving behind isn't really in the technology. It's in getting people to figure out how we can use it and agree to use it. Let's look at Starlink when we're thinking about SpaceX and this low Earth orbit constellation. There's a lot of concern about littering low Earth orbit with this many satellites. Um, and because most people were not interested in low Earth orbit for a significant period of time, they really wanted geostationary orbit, we didn't have as robust of a rule system as how we place satellites there, how we license that spectrum, this international scheme of how we kind of save space in different orbits. And so it was really complex to figure out how SpaceX was going to do this. Um, some of the satellites are already up. I'm not sure what percentage of the constellation is actually launched. Um, if you, you can go on their website and figure out how to track it, I've seen them across the sky. It's crazy to see all the little dots perfectly in a row as they arch over the horizon. So this has already started on what is basically a provisional licensing from the United States. And a lot of countries were kind of concerned about that, and maybe rightly so, right? This is this takes up a lot of space and does this stop other countries from doing these types of activities in low earth orbit? And so as these things move forward, it's not a question of the technology, it's a question of how we as humans agree to let these activities move forward. Uh, one more quick thing to mention about the Starlink project is that when you have these really small CubeSats in that order, they have a pretty high rate of failure. And I, you know, and I think it's still only like, don't quote me on this, like 10 to 15% at the most, maybe even lower than that, but that's still, pretty bad, right? But you put so many up that the constellation still functions. And so it works because it's massive. So you can't just take it down to a small scale and say, well, we're still gonna get the coverage. You have to have this massive amount of coverage to get the broadband access. So of course we wanna defeat those infrastructure challenges, but there's also these really other challenging problems that things like this present. Space debris, you know, we can go and we can clean these things up. What happens when we grab the wrong satellite? What happens when there is conflicts about how things were cleaned up, whose things were cleaned up, what to do with those debris, even if it maybe is a dead satellite, it might still be proprietary. Uh, the other big problem that we deal with with space debris um, cleaning up is who's gonna pay for it, right? The most expensive part of operating in space is gravity, right? Gravity is our biggest milady when it comes to getting into space. It's very expensive to launch things into our atmosphere. And there's not a lot of financial incentive to go clean this up, right? And so who's going to pay for that? These are questions that humans need to work together to answer, right? And so what I think encourage our students to think about is as we're thinking about how we interact with space, is to think to yourself, what's my prime directive, right? To take it back to a nerdy storytelling spacey place, What's our prime directive as a species? As we think about how we want to interact with space, is it about access for all? Is it about getting further faster, right? Different people are going to have different questions to this answer. And I think people who engage in this sector and who write meaningfully in this sector need to ask themselves this question of, of what their purpose is. And one of my answers to that question is diplomacy. Um, and I'm going to venture to say that I believe that diplomacy is the heart of space ventures. Um, now, 
I'm going to, I admit you're going to put a bunch of lawyers in a room where you're not going to walk out with a rocket, right? So clearly he, the, the STEM fields are, are fundamentally key to all of this, right? Um, so I'm not trying to denounce that by any stretch of the imagination. And please don't interpret anything I say during this talk to do that. But as we work together with other countries, uh, space has this unique capability of escalating and de-escalating at the same time, as we are so excited to see our species reach past our planet, but also knowing that a lot of the skills that it takes to have an active and effective space program signal your military strength, signal your abilities in other ways. And so that's where diplomacy comes in and how we sort of relax that process and navigate that process um, as human culture together, thinking through that. And we don't get anywhere without diplomacy. So here's an example. This is the International Space Station. I hope that you're all familiar with that at this point, but here's the International Space Station um, from 2000. But to get to this, where we have this space station, right, that's coming up or well over 20 years now, right, that, it, that is doing all these different things with these labs, um, it required this multinational framework to make this possible, right? So back in 1998, we have these 15 government officials posing for this wonderful photo um, behind where you can see that they're starting to construct the ISS to sign this agreement. And I, every time I think about this picture, I take a moment and think how many lawyers were in the background of this process, whether or not it was the government official themselves to their teams that were negotiating every piece of this contract in terms of who owns what, the intellectual property considerations, the export control and ITAR issues that they were all probably dealing with um, as they were working collaboratively across countries, um, the agreements that relate to the people who were actually actively doing research on the center, right? This is a major example of the success of law. So it's a scientific achievement, bar none, absolutely. But I also contend that it's an achievement for the humanities and it's an achievement for the legal field and for diplomacy in a big way and shows us what we're capable of. So here, I, th I think there's something special that lawyers bring to the table, particularly in the space industry. And so when we link diplomacy and the skills that diplomats have with lawyers, and of course, many diplomats are lawyers, right? Um, but there's something that lawyers do that is special. And what we do is we solve problems, right? People don't come to lawyers when things are going great or when there's an easy solution. Uh, to their problem, they come when things are complex and we have conflicts or we have questions that we just don't find a middle ground to on our own. And so we bring in people who are trained to be problem solvers. And that's the excellent, wonderful space that we all get to train in, work in, live in, which is the law. Um, finding common ground, solving disagreements, pursuing justice and what that means, thinking about access to space in this instance, or uh, representing your country zealously. We navigate sensitive subjects. And when it comes to escalation issues and thinking about how we work in space, it's a very sensitive subject for many countries. Um, and, and just generally, as we think about preserving space for future generations, we seek common language. And of course, we advocate and advance the interests of the people that we represent. So these are really critical skills when it comes to solving some of those problems we just talked about with remote servicing, with Starlink, with space debris, right? Is finding the ways to come to these sorts of agreements. And that's what lawyers can bring to the table. Um, I love this little picture. I just think it's funny, but you know, science can make the bombs, humanities can prevent them from going off. Um, again, full disclosure, I was in STEM before I, uh, found the law. I was, people who are actually engineers are going to laugh when I say I was in STEM and then tell you I was a web developer. But I worked, I was a coder um, and built websites for many years before I went to law school and have a deep love for that. I serve on several boards about getting underrepresented individuals in STEM into coding. Um, but humanities has my heart for a lot of reasons. And it's, it's all those things I just talked about. So let's go through some examples of where the law has helped how we interact with space, or at least is trying to, <laughs> right? So the first is the Outer Space Treaty and some of those follow-on agreements. I'm gonna guess that a lot of you are going to be learning about the Outer Space Treaty in your courses or already have. So I'm not gonna go through all the articles here with you. But I think one of the important things to note about the Outer Space Treaty is that it was really born of these Cold War origins, uh, particularly between the US and the USSR, right? And so in 1967, when this is signed, we're kind of at the height of fear of, of what space assets mean and that escalation piece that I keep mentioning when we think about space capabilities and how they might signal to other countries that 
something similar to an arms race, right? Space race, arms race. And you can see that all over the, the face of this treaty. It's all about peaceful purposes. It's all about scientific endeavor and collaboration and non-appropriation and thinking about how we interact with space in that way. Uh, there's also these follow-on agreements of the rescue and return agreement and the liability convention. Now, of course, as we're dealing with modern space issues, lawyers are still arguing arguing about amb ambiguous language in here and what this all really means. No piece of law, um, international, domestic, or otherwise, is ever going to cover the swath of situations um, that it could. So I, I'm not here to say that the OST solved all of our problems. We no longer have any questions about how we collaborate in space. No, there, there's still many, many problems to solve and many issues that no one was thinking about when this treaty was designed. But we do have tools in the toolbox to start these types of conversations, um, including some conflict management or conflict uh, uh, places to solve our conflicts. Did I mention I've been on Zoom for five hours, right? <laughs> Um, so we look at the International Court of Justice and, of course, the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, who works with any country who becomes spacefaring to ensure that they are signing and ratifying this treaty um, and kind of seeing how countries are ratifying it by enacting their own national space legislations. And so this is just one example of how lawyers are helping people compromise um, and feel comfortable operating in space. I think another great example is International Telecommunications Union as we think about access to space in terms of orbits and in terms of spectrum. Um, I, when I first heard about the World Radio Communications Conferences 10 years ago, um, I, this just blows my mind. So every, I think it's three years is their cycle. There's a WRC conference and people from around the globe gather at these conferences as they move around the world to hash out contracts as they relate to radio communications um, in terms of waves and spectrum and all of those access issues. And each year they set a new set of priorities. What a beautiful example of massive international collaboration, right? And then a big large report is put out from the groups that manage this. So there is venues for us to work together internationally, um, not to avoid conflict, but to lean into it and try and solve those conflicts um, through these really peaceful, thoughtful, intellectual matters. And of course, sometimes it's even harder than that, and we need to prepare for a rise in conflict. Um, you know, I, especially as an American who works in the space industry, I haven't not been able to talk about Space Force for the last two years. Um, but thinking about the militarization versus the weaponization of space and sort of the distinction between those two um, and how the military interacts with space. Um, and then creating this manuals or ideas. There's several projects. Of course, I'm going to talk about the Woomer Manual Project here that the University of Nebraska and Canberra and Adelaide um, are all part of. And this is a picture of the Woomer launch site. Uh, but this manual, this idea of creating this rules of the road and a resource guide for how we think armed conflict and international humanitarian law and, and some of those things that guide military decision making should apply in space. Um, interesting ways to think about all of this. I, I, I always feel compelled to point out when I'm talking about space and um, peaceful purposes, but also the militarization of space. Um, at least on the U.S. side, you know, the same bill that created NASA in 1958 also gave the United States Air Force the authority to operate in space and made space a domain, and that was under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Air Force. So since the U.S. has been active in space, um, we have been thinking about military interactions there. So as much as that makes some people uncomfortable, um, it's absolutely a necessary part of the conversation when we're thinking about how we do decision making in space. So the, ne the next pivot I want to make here is when I when we were arranging this event, I know some of you were in a class uh, that Professor Blake mentioned earlier about cooperation and regulating conflict and competition, and he um, I, gave me a heads up that this is one of the things that we wanted to talk about was this interplay between all of these things. And I, and I have to admit, I hadn't really thought about my approach to space in these terms. And I sat back after I read the email, I thought, that is a big question. How am I going to try and take that on in this session? And so I kind of chewed on it for a while and thought about it. And I came up with sort of my philosophical responses, as well as some real practical responses. Um, I'm a Nebraskan, middle of the United States. One thing that we are known for in our part of the country is we're, we're practical people. I want to, you know, if there's not a way for me to actually apply this, what's the point of it? 
So I kind of am thinking about it from those two perspectives. So first, the philosophical piece that I, that I you know, I sat in my office and I thought very hard um, for a while thinking about what this meant, you know, whether we want to seek cooperation or if we want to encourage conflict and cooperation. And I kept thinking, are those things different? Um, that human conflict is obviously one of our constants as a species. If we look throughout history, there's kind of no ignoring that as is cooperation. In fact, we cooperate quite well if we have a mutual enemy, right? Uh, but beyond that even, we, we have just as many examples of both of those things. It's, so it's, it's sort of the same side of one coin and it's very difficult to have one without the other. Now, is space our final opportunity to say all of us as a species before some of us? But is our interest in saying that because we're thinking there's going to be conflicts? You know, and so this is a really interesting sort of philosophical question of how do we define those two things as different pieces. And so that's where I started to take it into the practical, at least how I was thinking about this question. And the first is that I think collaboration should always be the goal. Uh, and that's, uh, it rings hollow when I say it, and it probably because it, it kind of rings hollow in my mind as I think about how you practically do that. Um, the two big challenges I see to putting collaboration in the forefront as we think about how our policies are deployed and how we maybe lobby and think about what we want our um, governments to be doing is that leadership is constantly changing and with them the policies and the tone and the approach dramatically changes. So, you know, in the U.S. every 48 years, but every country is dealing with this as their leadership and their administrations turn over. Um, without a doubt, it's probably not I don't even need to say that the Obama administration to the Trump administration to the Biden administration has different tonal approaches to how we interact internationally, right? Um, and thinking about how we position ourselves as a country. And that makes a huge difference for the people on the ground who are working with at, at United Nations, who are negotiating on behalf of the United States as we think about any sort of arms control measures or we think about how we're interacting with space. The other thing that I think it's remiss to not think about when we're talking about this is the, the finances of all of this, uh, you know, particularly for non-state or non-governmental actors in the commercial space sector, uh, many of whom are still military contractors who might be getting military funding. Um, the global money markets add a huge layer of complexity to this. Um, and there's plenty of economists, at least that I work with, who are going to tell me that competition is fundamental to the development of, the, of an innovative space industry. Um, I'm not an economist, so I'm not gonna talk about that, but I, but I felt it was necessary to talk about money markets. Um, a project I'm working on, a quantitative project I'm currently working on is looking at direct foreign investments following international press coverage of a civil space activity and whether or not there really is a connection there um, with direct foreign investment after you signal that you're capable of space launches. Um, so I'm thinking about this a lot and trying to, to think about it in a more holistic way. I do think that we can still admit that competition and conflict are part of human nature and are, are probably almost impossible to remove from the discussion by thinking about resolution mechanisms that will allow us to seek collaboration whenever possible, right? These ideas of rules of the road, I think are really pivotal in planning for conflict, right? That we should not just be so optimistic that it's not gonna happen, but rather plan for it. So can you do both of those things at once? Yes, I think you can. Although that's very difficult. I think it's a, it's a gray area. Um, so what does it look like in practice? So I started thinking about, well, what, what would I advise a leader right now, right? To, to push a policy forward that both acknowledged conflict and competition, but sought collaboration. And I thought I should turn to people who are smarter than me, who have been thinking about this for a long time. And uh, here, of course, I turned to the Secure World Foundation. And this is a fantastic briefing um, that they gave to the Biden administration in December of 2020. Um, I didn't put the PDF link on there because it was big and ugly, but you go to South uh, Secure World Foundation website and you look for their briefing from December 2020 that they um, pushed towards the Biden administration that I generally hope the Biden administration is looking at. A couple of things, I'm not going to read this to you, I, I promise, but a couple of things that I want to mention that I think kind of fall in the zone that I'm talking about 
is here in national security space, these are screenshots from the report itself, is to establish norms of behavior in military space activity. So again, we're thinking about how do we create an international structure of how we expect militaries to operate? And perhaps that can kind of take care of some of that escalation issues that we might see. That if people know that other people are following these certain rules and there's certain expectations of behavior, um, it's not gonna be seen as provoking or as trying to escalate a situation. And space diplomacy, this bottom one, which is increased engagement with domestic, commercial, and other non-governmental stakeholders on our policy, uh, diplomacy objectives, excuse me. I think this is really important. And you can kind of see it here in this next section as well, where we clarify to commercial actors that they're required to abide by these legal principles. Um, everyone's probably familiar with the phrase new space, right? Commercial space is, is booming or trying to. Um, and every day, or not every day, but a lot, I run into commercial operators who reach out to us to say, hey, you guys, you know, I'm sure you have law students who will work for free. We, we don't do that. Maybe extern for credit, but never work for free. Um, you know, we, we haven't thought about law yet. And I think, do you realize <laughs> that you're subject to all of these rules? You obviously haven't gone in to apply for your licensing yet and don't re recognize that you're a part of this huge global structure and that these international principles apply to you because you are a representative of the launching state in which you are a part of. And um, recognizing that, I think actually helps the spirit of collaboration internationally. And the commercial space piece, um, establishing an international dialogue on regulating commercial space. So thinking about new space, not just in the US, but new space across the world um, and the different services, whether you're looking at satellite communications in Australia, launches in New Zealand, uh, the new satellites that India just put up this winter, right? Some of these interesting things that commercial space has going for it and thinking about an international dialogue instead of this really national specific dialogues that we tend to see right now. And then of course, mega constellations. I think those two things really tie together, which is the concerns that other companies and other countries have about SpaceX, for example, um, and in turn thinking about um, debris mitigation. So those are some of the practical pieces of advice I thought of where I said, how can I go in there and tell them that I want you to think about collaboration, but prepare for conflict. These are, I think, are some actually really solid pieces of advice of, of what we should be pursuing as space lawyers in this field. And so with that, I'm gonna stop talking at you. I have no idea how long I've been talking. I think I did okay, about 40 minutes. And I look forward to some of your questions. Um, I put this information up here. I personally don't have a Twitter anymore, which was an excellent method, mental health choice, I must admit. But you can follow us on uh, Space Cyber Law and at the Nebraska Government Technology Center which handles there. And occasionally I do take over still um, our websites and my email is there as well. Um, I will stop sharing because I was told to stop sharing, but I'm happy to throw those in the comments or share them another way as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elspeth. That was um, really engaging, informative, uh, relevant, and important. So um, thank you very much. We, we have some questions to start off with, and I encourage people who are online at the moment to start um, upvoting, commenting on the questions, and adding your own questions as well. But we have uh, four questions already, two from Philip, one from Will and one from uh, Emmett. I'm going to start with um, with the question from Philip, and uh, it's associated with a question from Emmett as well. Both of those are about non-state actors. Philip, in particular, wants to know about um, how non-state actors are regulated, and specifically, he asks, as more state and non-state actors develop their respective capabilities and presence in space, what laws govern potential conflicts involving the assets of said state and non-state actors that occur in space. For example, if, if an American asset were destroyed deliberately uh, by a Chinese asset in space, could that be considered an act of war? Is there a space version of international law? So it is quite a broad question, but part of the question um, is about non-state actors. And uh, Emmett, so, so I'll get you to ask, to, to answer the two questions together. Emmett's question is also about non-state actors. And he's specific, his question is essentially, are the non-state actors, especially uh, I'm guessing 
like SpaceX, for example, getting too big for their boots. Um, in recent news, SpaceX and American, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, Emmett's question, are we facing an erosion of power of multilateral agreements, legal, diplomatic and policy in the wake of an increase in state reliance on non-state corporate entities for the provision of space services? How can states and in intergovernmental organisations mitigate cartel behaviour beyond the horizon where states cannot enforce their international obligations, where they cannot see untoward behaviour or lack the capacity to enforce Article 6 of the Outer Space uh, Treaty, particularly as monopolies forms. You might have to explain Article 6, but essentially uh, Emmett is asking, are the non-state actors getting too big for their boots? So um, your thoughts, uh, Elsa? Well, first of all, both of those questions, um... Boy, if I had a concrete answer, I'd write a book and make tens of dollars in the academic sector. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say up front that you're going to get the lawyer. It depends answer on all of those things. And some of these are questions that I actually think Professor Blank would be wonderful to answer as well. Um, but but I'll, 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 I'll take a hack at it. So the first piece, thinking about non-state state actors um, and in and, I'm guessing many of you are quite aware of this, you know, they're licensed um, through their launching state. And we take responsibility for them as a country when they launch here, right? If they're, if they, if they're li uh, licensed through the US, um, we have to basically indemnify that and take control of what they're doing, which is why we authorize and supervise those space activities. Uh, one of the things that we're wrestling with right here in the US um, for non-state actors is activities outside of launch and re-entry. Um, we have a pretty old and relatively robust system for licensing, launching, and re-entry. Uh, what we forgot to do in 1984 and then again in the two, early 2000s was think about what the heck they did while they were up there um, and who should be regulating that. Um, and we are still debating that here in the US between the Department of Commerce, um, which is actually where NOAA sits, who handles all of our remote sensing licensing, whether that should be the federal communications, the FAA, which is our federal aviation administration, which handles actually all of the launch provisions. So we have currently what is a pretty disjointed patchwork approach to coping with our non-state actors here in the United States. Um, when I mentioned um, UNOSA or the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, um, kind of thinking about how states ratify the treaty, that's what we're talking is how are they overseeing their uh, non-state actors, right? How are they looking at these commercial industries? And I think your, your question is really fair because this is going to look different in every country, depending on their resources, depending on their history in space, depending on how their market is being funded. Um, you know, there's certain countries where there isn't a huge private space network industry yet, where it really is state actors, sort of like the U.S. pre 1995 ish. Um, really in the 80s is when we started to take a turn and seeing lots of private activity in space based on communication satellites. And, you know, we hadn't implemented that much because it was just NASA. So we were authorizing and supervising ourselves, right? And, and some states are still sort of in that zone where they're able to authorize and supervise themselves. Others are starting to think about what they're going to do with these private actors and how to do that. And internationally, we're still sort of coping with and trying to agree with each other about what some of those standards should look like and whether those standards are in line with every article of the Outer Space Treaty. In terms of what happens when a non-state actor deliberately you know, would kinetically attack a space asset of another country. Um, first of all, I think the word deliberate is pretty important. Um, but I think, I mean, that's a that's a hyper contextual question in terms of, of how this came about and whether or not um, when you go through an attribution process, you could put that on the United States if even though it was a U.S. country or a U.S. company, right? I, I don't think that we have a great answer for that. And this is where Professor Blake might actually have a better answer for you than I do uh, in terms of how we would attribute that back being a non-state actor and what sort of, you know, balancing test we need to go through to say, does that rise to the level of, of that type of aggression um, where there's some sort of countermeasure that is authorized, right? And is going to make sense for that other nation. Um, I'm going to pause to potentially give you an opportunity. Do you want, I, I would love to hear your take on this question. I think it, it's a big tricky one. I will <laughs> uh, step in for a moment. So uh, there, if I hold it, hold it in front of me, there's a, a good resource that, um, that students of law and, and even others might want to look at. The International Law Commission did their 
articles on state responsibility. And those articles on state responsibility talk quite a lot about um, how international law generally um, handles the question of attribution. Um, attribution of the conduct of a non-state actor to, to the state, that is where the state is responsible for the actions of a non-state actor. Um, that's, that is difficult though in its application to space for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but one of the complications um, that arises in its application to space is, is Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, because the Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty is um, sui generis, if you like. It's in a class of its own. It's, uh, it's different from general international law. It makes it um, uh, very clear that the, the government is responsible for all of the activities of, of non-state actors, which is... Um, sounds ideal, which is, which is uh, potentially a great outcome. Um, but uh, in answer to Emmett's question about whether maybe um, there is, uh, you know, some are getting, some non-state actors are getting too big for their boots. Um, of course, until SpaceX and others um, uh, sort of escape the surly bonds of Earth, um, and go to Mars as they plan to do. They're still subject to, you know, the laws of various states and transnational corporations of any, um, in any context um, uh, are going to be subject to states, to, to the laws of various states. The, the, the issue in all of those contexts is, um, is, is standardization, harmonization, sort of commonality of approach among governments to, to regulating the behaviour of transnational corporations so that wherever they go, they are subject to um, uh, regulation that is, is similar in nature, hopefully in intent as well. Um, I think that's a really big challenge though, and, and I think it'll be some time before we're, we're there. I'm going to move on to a question from uh, Will, who's um, the question's got a few um, thumbs up, unsurprisingly, because it's a question that is um, particular to Australia. Um, and, and that's Australia's sort of situation as one of the 18 state parties to, to the Moon Agreement. Um, uh, next to the fact that we have signed up to be uh, a participant in the Artemis Accords. Um, so the Moon Agreement, of course, uh, requires that when exploitation of space resources becomes um, possible, the state parties are required to uh, work together to negotiate an international regime for um, uh, for regulation of, of extraction of space resources. The Artemis Accords um, are, are very much a bilateral approach. So um, the, the question is really is um, whether you have a perspective on that. Has, has Australia put itself in a tricky situation or is, um, is, is there the prospect still of an international re regime for um, regulation of extraction of space resources. So, you know, I had the opportunity to actually ask some of your colleagues this a few weeks ago in a, in a panel that I moderated. And I, th I think that's a really hard question, right? The U.S. approach to appropriation um, is not popular internationally, uh, but I think that there is lots of interest in allyship with the U.S. space program and with US space capabilities. And so it puts other countries, I think sometimes in a difficult situation and I'm not here to make an assessment on the, the morals or ethics of, of that situation, um, but I think there's a real reality to it. I think that's a very fair question. I think where things stand from a technical perspective right now, you can still walk that gray line, right? You can still say that I can meet the specifications in this treaty based on the actions that I'm capable of taking today and also meet the obligations of this other treaty. Now, as technology evolves and we're doing different things, that becomes untenable. So you might have disparate obligations, but until those obligations are actually called into action, technology available to us, you kind of get to skirt the question, right? And you don't have to make a choice to which one you want to honor until that, that technology gets you to the place where you have to do that. 
So does that put people in a tight situation when they have that? Of course, absolutely. Um, do I think everything in the global market will probably change four more times before we have some more of those types of questions? Also probably. And so I'm guessing somewhere along the line, this decision that the signaling of allyship to the US space program took some sort of precedence uh, over kind of that difficult situation. Um, and I'm saying this as an American, right? So I'm, I'm coming at it from probably a, a potentially different perspective, I suppose. Um, you know, in the talking points that we, you know, that, that our country is putting forth, Artemis is really meant to underscore the cooperative principles and ideals of the Outer Space Treaty. I don't know that's that's how it's being received internationally, but, but that's how we are um, promoting it and thinking about it and treating it. And so, you know, not trying to put people in those sort of tight positions, but rather um, thinking about this in another way. And, you know, America loves bilateral agreements. It's kind of our jam. So we, we <laughs> think about things in that way. It's not surprising that that's the approach, particularly under the administration and um, agency leadership that they came about under. If you think about um, the uh, relatively conservative approach to some of these things. Um, I think there's also some background there for some people who worked at NASA and who work in space policy in the government. You know, during the Obama administration, there was so many efforts um, to advance some soft law that failed miserably. And, and the Obama administration was sort of notable for writing these really internationally driven, we're all friends, kumbaya kind of space policies and using that kind of language, but then being completely inflexible when it came to discussions of arms and completely inflexible in terms of new obligations. Um, and that, I mean, that was the Bush approach as well, but with stronger language. Uh, so it's, it's that, that was sort of a historical approach. And, um, you know, Biden was a part of that administration, also saw a similar approach that we took with some domestic legislation that failed him. And so I think his administration might take a different approach to this. Certainly Trump did um, and said, instead of doing this soft law behind the scene things in Geneva, when we're talking, when we're, you know, when we're doing these di diplomatic discussions and the general public probably really isn't that aware that we're talking about space from a diplomatic perspective, the Trump administration said, build a website and they will come, right? And we don't, please don't put that on a t-shirt somewhere. That was a stupid thing to say or a bad line, but it feels a little true, doesn't it? Yeah. That they went out there with this really big PR approach to this soft law, right? And it, that's what it is. It's another <laughs> agreement in this way, in some ways, um, to try and you know redefine how we were interpreting co cooperation. Um, and, and so there's, I think, a lot of politics going on internally, domestically, and internationally when we look at the Artemis Accords. Um, really fascinating document with some really, really interesting stuff in there in terms of how it's going to play out internationally. Yes, a, 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 another fasc fascinating aspect um, or, or supplement to the Artemis Accords was the um, executive order that President Trump signed around the same time that the Artemis Accords were being developed. And um, the executive order is actually very overt in directing the Department of State, I think, to, to proactively um, push the position that the US, I can't remember the exact words used, but uh, doesn't like the moon agreement and you know, dislikes even less the, the, the phrase common heritage of mankind. Um, uh, so um, th there are probably some legal reasons why uh, there was felt to be a need to be proactive. And maybe if you could just expand on on that why why was the administration being so you know vociferous about um not liking the moon agreement and not liking the art and uh, not liking the common heritage of mankind so i think i think a lot of what you saw in that executive order was a lot more politicking right so mostly what's in there um was relatively unnecessary from a US domestic law perspective, right? We had the 2015 Space Competitiveness Act. Um, that if you've heard Ted Cruz in the news, that was his, right? Um, <laughs> that we put through that, that talks about our take on appropriation and our plan to allow the licensing of any US company who wants to go and mine celestial resources and bring them back. Um, and so anything that was in there was sort of it basically just underscored what already was our domestic law and that already was sort of our domestic approach. And it's something that we saw that administration do a lot, which was sort of 
posturing. And, and so legally it wasn't terribly necessary, right? Or at all necessary. Those laws were already on the book. That was already the take we had. I think the Trump administration felt strongly that they wanted to be the administration that put it out in a really big public way. And a lot of posturing there in terms of, we're gonna leave this industry. We're in charge of commercial space. We are the United States, I'm paraphrasing. I'm, this is not my personal opinion. And this is obviously, I'm not inside of that administration. So take that with all of those caveats. Um, but, but posturing about how we or how this administration or that administration was viewing the commercial space sector in the US as being a formidable leader that was going to say, no, we're going to set the norms for what we're going to do in commercial space. Now, that's not a very cooperative approach. And it, it goes back to what I was talking about a little bit in the talk, which is to say, you can plan for conflict without being openly competitive and different leaders are going to take different approaches. And so the U.S. approach that we're probably going to have in the next four years is going to look very different than that. I don't think you're going to see an executive order like that out of the Biden administration. Now, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. The executive order's out there, even if our president has changed. And, um, and to me, that's part of what makes space diplomacy and space law equal parts really maddening and frustrating, but also so exciting and interesting because it's an incredibly dynamic area of the law because it is so just inherently international and rooted in a lot of political decision-making. Um, I, I think it would be, uh, my suspicion is that there was lots of military interested posturing happening there, economic and trade interested posturing happening. Um, and that's not necessarily bad politics. You know, I, it's not an administration that I, pers this is again, my opinion, not of the University of Nebraska or anyone that I am affiliated with. I, that was not my favorite administration. I did not vote for that administration. There was many things that came out of it that I think were exceedingly problematic in many, many ways. Um, but there's, we've had politicians in the past who have done the same sort of signaling. In fact, you know, our beloved President Kennedy, we talk about that a lot. He could have given NASA a different directive. It didn't have to be go to the moon. There was things that actually would have saved millions of lives that we could have worked on first, mm -hmm. right? We, there was a major project at the time about desalsifying ocean water, other things. And there's posturing involved in space. And so from a political science perspective, it's a pretty interesting thing to look at. So there's, there's potentially, I guess, some legal ramifications of executive orders like that. You know, they expire with their president. Uh, but the words are out there. Um, the best I can tell to you is that I, it, it was posturing, but I think there's long-term impacts of that um, in our international relations that our diplomats and the folks at the State Department deal with. Mm. Um, okay, well, so we've talked a, a little bit about non-state actors. We've talked a bit about exploitation of um, space resources, and there's... Um, Two questions that are, are proving quite popular that are related to, to launch. Um, so Australia uh, is, is late to the launch party in a way, although um, we, there was a UK rocket that was launched in um, 1967, I think, out of, out of Australia. Um, no, sorry, it was a US rocket that was launched out of Australia. Um, but um, put together by Australian scientists and um, in many ways uh, Australia was heavily involved but it wasn't our rocket. So, so we didn't quite make the um, spacefaring um, nation list at that stage but we have some commercial operators who are developing um, uh, launch vehicles and launch facilities in Australia trying to catch up with our friends just across the ditch in uh, New Zealand that have, uh, have rocket lab. Um, and uh, the Australian Space Agency's new head, um, Enrico Palermo, uh, would like for Australia to become a launching nation. And this is the question from Matthew. There are relatively few launching nations in the world at the moment. Do you see significant legal or regulatory hurdles for Australia to become a launching nation so early after the inception of its space program? And uh, Christie's got a uh, question that is very much related. Um, in your experience, have you observed conflict between law and ethics when working towards norms in space? You particularly asked, uh, sorry, the, uh, there, there was a question about launch there before I've, I've lost that for the moment, but we'll focus on, um, sorry, uh, it's Amy's I think question. I, I think I saw it. 
Yeah, yeah. And I see it moving around too. It's moving on you. Yeah. <laughs> um, what immediate legal and political risk do you see for a nation which has developed a, a, a launch capability? Um, so over to you. Yeah, tell us about launch um, and regulation and launch. Yeah, so, you know, I think the, the biggest barriers, of course, is money. It's it's always money and finding someone who needs to use your launch capabilities, right? And a civil program probably um, it, it obviously has some need for some, some, some launching, but really you want to make sure that you have some commercial usage as well. Um, and I think it's a really complicated problem, particularly in the authorization and super, uh, supervision pieces, if you don't have a really robust national space legislation. And, and like I said, I, there's, there's problems with the US sector of doing this, but we have one of the, probably the more the more robust national space legislations out there. And we still haven't quite figured out the right ways to do this. Um, one interesting thing to maybe go look at, the FC, FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, released our new launch licensing protocols, I think in September for commenting, and I think it's now officially law. Um, thinking about how we do this because we've had to continually change it as technologies have changed and as the actors have changed you know when we were dealing with only major telecoms who we were only interested in communications some of the ways that we thought about what these missions were going to do were a lot different now we're looking at these commercial operators who are trying to do crazy things all over the place right whether or not they're trying to do remote satellite servicing whether or not they're launching into orbits we never anticipated people wanting to launch into um, whatever the gamut of those activities might be. And so crafting a legislation that is not overly burdensome, that doesn't squash innovation of a new and really financially unstable market um, is really hard right? <laughs> to, to not be overly burdensome. So that balance, I think, is one of the most difficult things that lawmakers and policymakers might go wade into. Um, you know, there's a longstanding joke that probably all of you have heard, um, where the fastest way to become a millionaire in the space industry is to start as a billionaire. These yeah. companies are hanging on by a thread, and most of them really only have their angel investment or their, whatever their start was. Um, for maybe three to five years. And if they don't get a launch in that time, they're done so. So you can't overregulate them because they simply can't afford the lawyers, right? Or they can't afford the, the paperwork and what it takes to go through a rigorous launch process. On the other side of that, we don't want companies that aren't, first of all, liquid enough to suffer a catastrophe and companies that don't have the structure necessary to be launching things, because these are inherently flying bombs, right? They can blow up on a launch pad. It's a very, very dangerous activity. And, you know, most countries have a healthy history of regulating dangerous activities. That's part of the reason the law exists, right? Mm -hmm. And so finding that balance between protecting um, your national interests, right? Because don't forget, if you're the launching state, you're on the hook when things go boom. So, you know, here in the US, we have a, it's a three tiered risk, uh, risk sharing regime. So we require a certain amount of insurance packages um, on all of these launches. A fun aside, I would love to tell everybody sometimes I met the actuary who worked on one of the first launches in 1984 at the FAA. And can you imagine being an actuary and then being handed that like, here, no one's ever done this, figure out how we insure it, you know? <laughs> How do you how do you do that? So I think that's really interesting. So we require them to have some amount of insurance, certain amount of liquidity, and then over a certain point, um, the U.S. agrees to indemnify any losses over that. So if there's massive loss of life or massive loss of um, of other things, ensuring that the company can weather that or at least pay. I mean, they're probably going to fold, but if they could at least pay first, that'd be good, right? Yeah. So you don't want to overregulate. But you also can't underregulate. You really can't, and still meet your international obligations, and protect your citizens, and protect your own internet or state resources. So there's a lot of balls in the air when you're looking at this. Not to mention those things I mentioned earlier, such as all of the communication skills you're going to need in terms of the spectrum, um, waves, where you're launching, when you're launching, those launch windows. Um, all of those pieces that have to be coordinated among lots of different agencies. Um, I think New Zealand's approach is fascinating in terms of air traffic management and launching like a plane and using traditional runways. I, I think it's, I don't know much about it, so I can't speak intelligently to it other than to say I geeked out pretty hard when I learned more about Rocket Lab and thinking about 
the different regulatory approach and structure you could use if you were thinking about them as airplanes. Mm -hmm. um, very, very different approach than what we have in the US. The way that we treat aviation is quite different than how we think about space. Um, and so blurring that line, I think, is a really interesting proposition. I don't know if that really answers those questions, um, but those are the first things that kind of come into my mind. Yeah, I, I will add a few things. So um, for for the people who are listening, um, uh, particularly the, the students who are listening, the, it's, it's worth, worthwhile. I, I don't have the link to hand, but um, the Washington Post did a really interesting infographic about um, launches out of, I think, Cape Canaveral and the impact that that has on the uh, air traffic around the eastern coast of the United States. And it's huge. It's a huge yeah. impact. They have to clear that, all of that airspace, and they clear that airspace for quite a few hours. When you consider the amount of air traffic that goes along the uh, east coast of the United States, um, you can begin to get an idea of the impact that that had. Of course, with uh, with pandemic restrictions, it's probably less than it uh, has been in, in the past. But wherever you launch, that that is going to be a factor. But um, as, as I mentioned before, and Elspeth mentioned before, different states have different regulation. And I'm just trying to remember an incident quite relatively recently in China um, China has launches in uh, areas that are um, close to areas that are populated. I think a, a failed rocket came down in, on, uh, in the vicinity of a village. I think the village was compulsorily evacuated before that, but it still came down um, in, in this village. Um, so, you know, there are dangers uh, there and uh, th they need to, need to be taken into account. Um, and a word about um, the, the, the amount of regulation, and I think I, I might get you to expand um, a li little bit, Elspeth, the, um, the different federal agencies that are in the US that are involved in different aspects of regulating um, space activities. Um, and, 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 and as um, you answer that, Elspeth, to, to the people who are listening, just keep in mind that for each one of those um, federal agencies, there are, you know, there'd be a, um, an, an act that covers it, there'd be subordinate legislation, there would be a raft of policies and procedures, and a team of people that administer those, right? Yes. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, we have what I keep terming a patchwork approach. And what I mean by that is that we don't have a one-stop shop. And, and I'll, I'll return to that here at the end because it's important because it's what we're trying to do now. Um, but the flow of how our regulatory structure evolved literally makes some sense, although it's not super functional at the moment. So you know, in the mid 80s, Congress handed this authority to the Federal Aviation Administration when they started realizing that they had commercial actors who were interested in launching things, but they didn't know who should be in charge of figuring that out. Because like I said, prior to that, the only space activities were coming from our civil space agency. And so our international obligation to authorize and supervise those activities were easy. It was us doing it, right? They authorize and supervise themselves. And so when Congress was handed this, well, someone has to authorize and supervise this. It shouldn't be Congress. Who, what agency or what commission you're going to give this to? And so the obvious answer at the time was the FAA, our Federal Aviation Administration, and the Commercial Space Office was born. And, you know, in some ways, like you said, that makes a lot of sense. When anytime we launch something, there's a major air traffic control issue there, right? significant. And so um, it made sense. And I think that I think the thought was literally just stuff that's up in the air. This is how Congress made this choice. And so this is given to the Federal Aviation Administration. And as new technologies evolved, other agencies got in on the game, right? Um, one particularly troubling piece of this is remote sensing. Um, so anytime we have a camera pointed at the earth, right, we're looking at Google Earth, any of those sorts of things. There's also, of course, nefarious purposes for things like that that have less to do with your Ubers, and more to do with military surveillance. And so we're, of course, concerned about remote sensing. However, when this came up, Congress said, well, how about the weather people, NOAA, the National Oceanograph and Atmospheric Agency, I think. I think that's what NOAA stands for. Um, 
and which made some sense because they have weather satellites, they were doing remote sensing, right? So the idea was, okay, this is an agency that already runs remote sensing programs. This makes sense. Of course, the DOD was sort of like, we want to review these too. So there's sort of, sort of this weird two-step process. Um, and NOAA is not really an agency that's set up to run major pieces of regulation, right? They're not the FAA, who, which is how we license everything in our aviation industry. They're the weather people, right? That they're, they're, they're scientists who are doing weather research. It's fantastic, wonderful. This is not me dogging, by the way, on NOAA. Some of my favorite people work at NOAA and they do amazing work. Um, but I think that was a challenge to hand that to them. And then we started dealing with spectrum and communications challenges for these communication satellites. So they thought, oh, communications, we'll send that over to the Federal Communications Commission. <laughs> so then we have an office over there. And you know they have kind of split interests because we have all of the these these pieces of spectrum and bandwidth um, that's terrestrial. That's you know it's well below space, and so they're thinking about all of that spectrum as well as what we're using for major satellite communications, and of course all of the interference issues that come along with that. Um, commercial military sharing, government sharing. You know our government owns the majority of the spectrum in the United States. Um, and then, of course, we're doing this horrible rotation and orbit thing. So we have to share all of this internationally. Um, and so now the F I joke about it being horrible. Uh, so the FCC has to help us figure out how we're going to do that internationally. So, you know, I mentioned the WRC earlier, but all these private companies are also figuring out how they're supposed to manage the interests of the FCC, the different chairmen that come in and out, right? Like our most recent chairman, Ajit Pai, the FCC, you know, the big thing that he was pushing was 5G access. Well, 5G eats up a lot of spectrum that a lot of satellite companies wanted to use, right? So this is really controversial and you have different interests coming in with different leaders. So right there, you already see three agencies. Now enter the Trump administration and the interest in creating a one-stop shop. And the idea that this one-stop shop makes the most sense and wait for it, the Department of Commerce. <laughs> which, like I mentioned, inexplicably is also where NOAA is housed, um, as well as the National Telecommunications Industry Agency. So we also have <laughs> some of these other folks in there who are lobbying or who are responsive to certain industry things within the government. And then we have this new Department of Commerce office on commercial space. And the idea is, um, I think the idea was eventually that everything would live in this commercial space office in commerce. Um, at least I think that was Trump administration's goals, the stated policy objectives when they were created because they knew they couldn't rock the boat too much too fast, was that the FAA was going to continue to own launch and reentry because it goes through airspace, but launch and reentry only, and that all other commercial space activities were going to be managed at the Department of Commerce. Congress didn't like that very well. They received some marginal amount of initial funding. Um, I don't think they've been refunded in the latest round of appropriation bills. Um, and so I think that maybe they have some funding, but I'm not sure what general authorities they've been given. I mean, Congress really hands out authorities by appropriating funds, and I don't believe they have any, so or any new uh, renewed funds. And so that one-stop shop idea has, I don't know if it's died or dying or, or where that stands. The new FAA regulation that I talked about, which is aiming to streamline the licensing process, because our commercial sector has been clamoring for the last 10 years that this process is confusing, too complicated, too many agencies, too expensive, um, not timely, all of these things. And so the FAA took that and said they focus on launch and reentry because, of course, they were still dealing with the Trump administration's new office at the Department of Commerce. <laughs> and said, okay, we're going to streamline launch and reentry. So they have this new process um, that I, I'm not sure is fully implemented yet at this point. Um, like I said, that came out for commenting like late September. If you go to Space Policy Pod, if you just Google that wherever you listen to your podcast, um, Space Foundation puts that out. Uh, there was a great episode with the administrator from the FAA talking about how this legislation functioned right as it was going into the commenting period, and you can find it easily online. Um, how they're trying to streamline that. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see more notions of Congress asking the FAA to turn itself more into a one-stop shop. Um, there was also a industry spectrum working group this summer who was making recommendations in terms of making a separate spectrum department <laughs> outside of the FCC. So, uh, you know, it's hard to say if we're 
a dog chasing its own tail or if we're actually synthesizing things in a meaningful way. Um, but there's people at least thinking about this. And I think that that's, that's the first step is getting the government even interested in thinking about the organizational structure of our national space legislation. Um, you know, we teach an entire course just in US national space legislation because it's, it's sort of messy and we haven't even gotten into Space Force, right? We haven't even talked about the contractors. We haven't even talked about um, the military relationships there. And so, um, I, you know, I, that's a complex answer and there is military input, but those are the four main agencies that you would tick off on your fingers that currently have their hands in commercial space regulation. Thank you very much. So it's it's a it's a complex issue for any um, government um, seeking to administer space activities. Is is you know who, who's going to be responsible and how do you coordinate the various interests throughout government? Um, I, I guess we're lucky in Australia that um, the Australian Space Agency um, overtly has a regulatory role and is in in a sense the one stop shop. But having said that, yeah. there are different. Um, areas with a with a strong interest in space obviously um, the department of defense in australia the um, geoscience uh, australia is, is another organization that's a bit like NOAA. um there's csiro the commonwealth scientific and industrial research organization um, with a big interest in space um, department of foreign affairs and trade uh seeking to do the the diplomatic piece in respect of space so it's it's a challenging thing um, to to be a one stop shop uh, for space and uh, and yeah. the US and Australia are sort of indicative of the challenge in any government. Um, I, I definitely think that one of the things that cuts against the non stop shop thing is that you're taking expertise out of other departments. One of the big concerns about giving this to the Department of Commerce and taking it away from the FAA is that the FAA has been doing it for 20 years. And so why would we move it somewhere that has none of that experience? Why wouldn't we create our one-stop shop where it's been? Um, and I think that's really fair. I also think internationally, sometimes people are a little startled. Like you said, your space agency has that regulatory authority. They're surprised when our answer isn't NASA, but NASA is not a regulatory body, right? They're, <laughs> they're an administration focused on the missions. And in many ways they become almost a client, especially in the commercial crew programs. Um, and so in all those commercial collaborations, so they're not part of that licensing process for commercial actors at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we uh, we have a uh, quite a broad question. Um, I, I wrongly picked Christy before as the person with a question about launch, but she has a, actually a question about the, um, the interaction of law and ethics. Uh, and um, uh, I don't know how much you've delved into ethics before, so so this might be a challenging question, but uh, we'll see how you go. Um, <coughs> in your experience, have you observed conflict between law and ethics uh, when working towards norms in space? Do you see these across all nations and private enterprise, or do you see it more in other specific areas? So the interaction between law and ethics, what are your thoughts? So I, I don't, um, like you said, I don't, I don't have a background in ethics. So uh, I'll, I'll take a swing in it and maybe miss, but we'll see. Um, one, one thing that I think is interesting is that I, I think ethical and moral considerations, they always come to the forefront when people think about space, but we're gonna see them in any industry, right? There, there's always an opportunity to be unethical. And there's always an opportunity to take the high road, regardless of what industry you're in and regardless of what government agency or whatever it is that you're doing. So there's gonna be ethical issues in space, just like there are other places. What I think is interesting about space is that I think there are a little higher stakes, right? This is a, a, a new arena. This is a opportunity for bigger, better um, decision-making and collaboration and holding ourselves to a higher ethical standard. And mm -hmm. so when those stakes maybe falter, that, that's really hard. Uh, you know, th this isn't necessarily the ethics question, but I was on a podcast yesterday and they pulled out a question on me that really stumped me for a minute. And they said, well, what keeps you up at night? What's, what's the space issue that you lose sleep over? And the, first of all, the good news is I had to think for a while. So not many, apparently I, I sleep well. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one that I kept coming back to is there's this book by um, Peter Singer, who's a scholar and academic at New America, but also writes these kind of fiction 
fiction, but like plausible fiction, science fiction and war stories. And they're incredibly popular in the US Department of Defense, by the way. So if you ever want to get in with a bunch of officers at a like military event in the US, be like, hey, you read Ghost Fleet? And they will all say yes. Mm -hmm. But the beginning of Ghost Fleet, there's an astronaut who's on the ISS working with all these other countries and then is locked out of the space station. And it's the beginning of a war, right? The, the, the other countries have turned on him and left him to die in the vacuum of space. And you know, that in and of itself is of course very poetic and striking and terrifying. But I, I, I think that's the thing that keeps me up at night is the idea of kinetic action in space. And you know, I've said several times now that space has been militarized since 1958, at least for the US perspective. But what we don't see in space yet is that first, that first kinetic action, that first place where we show ourselves to be warmongers, that first place where we ruin what was previously a peaceful uh, domain. And, and that's what keeps me up at night is the ethics behind of how we make those decisions and in the world leaders that get to make those kind of decisions because of the space capabilities. And, and that's scary, right? That, that's, that's the question that keeps me up at night is, when we turn that corner that I don't think you can unturn. Yeah. And what's beautiful about space right now is we haven't, we haven't done that yet. And, and so that's the, that's the scary thing. And that's why I think ethics are so important. So even though it's not necessarily my research area, um, that's why I put up that silly slide earlier about what's your prime directive, right? And of course it's a Star Trek reference. So it's kind of goofy, but I also think it's very real, right? Like what is your guiding principle? as we think about space policy, because it matters when you're the junior attorney in the FAA's office who's working on this new blind licensing process, what is your moral objective? And how do you think about space? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I talked about posturing earlier. If you're on the advising team for the administration, what, you know, any place that you touch space, even if you're in a small way doing it, knowing what your objectives are as a human being interested in interacting with space, I think are really critical. Um, what sort of ethical metrics and how we approach applying those ethics on an international scale, that is over my pay grade. You know, I, there's people out there who study that, who are ethicists and are, you know, could tell you strategies for applying those sorts of things, but I, I'm, I'm not that person other than I can say, I think it's important. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, it's 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 a, a challenging issue, but there is um, I, I would say that uh, in terms of the conflict between law and ethics, I, I think that legal compliance is is not enough, and that that question of legal compliance might arise in the military context, but certainly yeah. also in in the commercial context. And the reason why legal compliance is 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 not going to be enough, and is often not going to be enough, is because um, laws take a while to be drafted, to be accepted, to to go through Parliament or Congress or the equivalent in in other countries. Um, so they're always going to be somewhat behind the eight ball. Um, so what you can do in space uh, is um, is not necessarily ethical, even if it's fully compliant with the law. Um, there have been some famous examples of uh, of non-compliance with the law that were not only non-compliant but also, also arguably unethical. And um, and you know the the two examples that immediately come to mind is the um, space bees by Swarm Technologies and tardigrades on the moon by um, a company in Israel, the, the name of the company is, um, is not coming to mind at the moment. But I think that um, the company in Israel, for example, argued that, that they'd pretty much done everything that they were required to do as a matter of law and, and they decided to, to add the tardigrades anyway. So, um, so that's my point that, that legal mm -hmm. compliance is not necessarily enough. Um, and that goes back to the oversight question as well, right? I mean, that, that's basically what happened in Israel is the international community was upset with the government and the government said, they complied with our, inter with our national regulations and their national regulations, you know, to the international community's mind, didn't appropriately authorize and supervise because they shouldn't have allowed that to have happened. Right. Um, and th so that's a really tricky question. And it's a question we get all the time. And it's a question we don't have an answer to yet. 
yeah. um, of, of how do we hold other states responsible. And, and I, you know, we haven't done much to hold Azura responsible for that, even though I think internationally, most of us think it was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there's also some sense that it could be any of us, <laughs> you know, the mistakes were made. And so <laughs> that, that's, that's a hard thing to do. And so if we set this precedent of sanctions or of some sort of international harm based on the failure to authorize and supervise the activities of this company that did this unethical thing, you know, how does that come back to us the next time Elon wants to put up a different car? I don't know how that looks, you know, so th there's interest that the other countries are bringing to the table here of when and how we choose to enforce things. Yeah. And um, I, I agree, I think it's critical that ethics are a part of that consideration. And I do think they're quite distinct from the law. Yeah, yeah. And in the military context that, you know, there's debate about whether uh, warfighting domain is, is the right phrase to use or operational domain or, or whatever. Um, so the law doesn't necessarily have a lot to say about that sort of thing, but ethics should would do ha have something to, to say about those sorts of things um, at, at the moment as well. Um, and and there's, a, there's a very big difference between, for example, um, a, a national policy or strategy that says, we are prepared to use space as a means to pursue our national interests, as opposed to um, we are uh, prepared to protect and enforce responsible use of space in order that space is there um, for our national interests. Um, you know, they're, they're two different things. Um, so even in the in the military context, um, ethics and law aren't necessarily coincident at all. Uh, but um, we'll move on to to some other questions. Um, so there's a question here from uh, Troy. I, I haven't had a chance to read this yet because I've been um, talking too much. We might we might not be able to take too many more questions. I think. Um, we're at at least uh, an hour and a half now, and I'm sure that um, that uh, Elspeth has places to be, things to do as well. So um, we'll we'll just do a couple of more questions. But um, a question here from Troy: uh, What are the main friction points between countries that may not be closely aligned with U.S. views on freedom of operation in space? Assuming that Chinese and Russian opposing views are a given. What are some of the other nations that have alternative perspectives on space law and, and, and what are these perspectives? Is it just China and Russia that, that don't agree with uh, the US in respect of um, some of its of the US approaches or, or are there other nations that, that would prefer a different approach as well? Oh, well, that's, a, that's a tenuous question, right? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's loaded. So first of all, I think one of the things that's important to point out when we're looking, say we're looking at the Artemis Accords, um, you know, we, we can at least try to do bilateral agreements with Russia. Uh, Na we, NASA is not allowed to do agreements with China under our current agreements, right? And so like, it's not even just a friction point, it's a conversation that can't even exist. So I think that's an important thing to point out that's different between China and Russia, who are meanwhile making their own bilateral agreements to work together on moon missions, right? So <laughs> there's all these other things happening in the background of those two things. Um, and whether or not we were referring to those countries as adversaries or not continues to be a major talking point in the US military from a PR perspective. In terms of other countries, I think one of the big friction points you mentioned earlier was the moon agreement. Um, and I think what that comes down to in my mind is that a lot of countries feel very differently than the US does about appropriation. And I would venture to say outside of Luxembourg and, and some parts of Europe, a good chunk of Europe doesn't like how we think about appropriation, but I'm not sure that they're willing to make that a policy direction, right? There's, there's, there's the politicking piece happening here, right? In terms of the allyship of one of the major spacefaring nations who's been in the game, not, not quite since the beginning, we missed that first orbit, but otherwise major player in the space sector, right? And so 
I, I do think that there are international contingencies that strongly disagree with this, right? Um, I was talking to a space lawyer from Ireland, Una Sands, who actually did a debate with us with a, a attorney that represented at the time, it's, it's now out of business, but a, a mining company at one of our conferences a few years back, and we had them do a debate on stage, like we were in moot court again in law school, and it, it was very fun. Um, and, and it was made, it made it very clear to me that a lot of the European interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty does not align with our 2015 Competitive Act. So I think the number one friction point with literally all other countries is appropriation, full stop. And, and I don't know that it's actually our interest in doing that so much as our interest in doing it as a you know, as a country, as you know, we want an American company to do this first. And we want this sort of this sort of America first kind of attitude that's inherent in that. And so I don't think it's actually like the technology or the action or the mining that is the friction point. I think it's the politics that are the friction point strongly. And this idea of how we view American enterprise. And, you know, we, we're even not imagining this as being NASA. We're imagining this being, but at the time, I think Planetary Resources was one of the companies that was really lobbying for this and throwing tons of money at it. Um, there's a little cart for the horse because they never got the technology off the ground before the company folded. Um, because they got the legislation passed. <laughs> so, but but it was it was about a private sector going and doing this and about what that would mean for US industry, not necessarily about scientific achievement. And I think that's actually the friction point a lot of other countries take with it. Um, I constantly feel like I have to add the caveat. This is my personal opinion. So <laughs> <laughs> this is not, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the United States to be very, very clear. Um, but, but that's that's my interpretation of that friction point that we have with some of the other big space players. Um, and then, of course, we continue to sort of, I don't know if agitate is the right word, but thinking about our relationship to the Russian space program in terms of wanting to take our own astronauts to the ISS. You know, the ISS was our one bastion of collaboration where all we all worked together and even that sort of started to become a strained point um, where, you know, we no longer wanted to use the Suez after we stopped the shuttle program. And so trying to get our own, uh, uh, actors there. Meanwhile, Russia wanted to have space tourism, right, and brought several millionaires on board. And so these, this push and pull of how we treat these collaborative things, there, there's friction coming from a lot of different places. And I also think, um, for better or for worse, kind of fun, but it's also, I think, kind of detrimental, we have all this posturing coming from all these different countries. Uh, one of the things that I constantly heard when I was learning about space politics and starting my kind of space education during the Obama administration was how frustrating is it, it was for the SECDA or the Secretary of Defense's office when they were with the delegation from the US State Department um, at the UN talking to people was that they would hear like, we're never gonna vote for that. We're gonna throw you under the bus for not wanting arms control, but please don't agree to any more arms control. We want you to keep, keep we in the US would call it keep your big stick. That whole idea of walk softly, but carry a big stick. Um, other countries who wanted the US to keep the power play and to continue to have that showing of strength because we were an allied relationship, but who wouldn't, from a political standpoint, vote in the same way. They, they were wanting us to be the bad guy, have their cake and eat it too. And I think that was a really frustrating piece of diplomacy. Now, that's not to say that we weren't also doing horrible things to other countries potentially in terms of how we did diplomatic affairs, and I, I can't speak to that. Um, but I think it leaves the US in a really interesting place when you're a power player in the room to allow yourself to be the bad guy on behalf of your allies. And that, that's part of our history and assuring our allies as well. I mean, that's, a, that's a, when we talk about deterrence modeling and we do war gaming as a political scientist and I think about assurance, that, that's part of it. And so you allow yourself to have international friction points maybe publicly that maybe aren't really there when the doors are closed. Yeah, um, I'll just add a point about, um, you know, sometimes international law, uh, you, you've talked a lot about the politics of international law, and, 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 and it is a very big part of international law, particularly as there is no international police force. Um, there's, there's often a view that um, international law is endlessly elastic in that, that you know, what states can decide whatever they want about international law. I, I oppose that view. I say it's not endlessly elastic. Um, states care about being seen to be legitimate. 
And mm -hmm. so, you know, while a lot of the um, nations of the world condemned Russia for what it did in Crimea, um, Russia sought to justify it by reference to, to international law. Um, and and uh, that legitimacy matters. It matters in terms of whether you might be able to get a UN Security Council resolution, whether you might be able to get hosting of bases on, in other countries, whether you can get domestic support, whether you're going to get the rest of the international community supporting you and whether you're going to be able to form an alliance, keep an alliance, maintain an alliance and have a coalition for a particular military operation, for, uh, for example. So that legitimacy matters. Um, and and so, so there there is a limit to, to the elasticity of international law and, and the limit to, to the politics. But having said that- Absolutely agree. Yes. I, and I, I, when, when you mentioning that makes me fear that I gave this the wrong tone. Uh, you know, there is the politicking happening there. But in terms of the US interest in adherence to international law, you're dead on, right? Like, the legitimacy of that structure is pivotal to all of our policies. And it's actually one of my pet peeves when I tell people about the work that we do with the Department of Defense. And they say, well, they just do whatever they want. They twist the law. And I say, you have not the faintest idea our adherence to LOAC. When we talk about the laws of armed conflict in, in the paperwork and the bending over backwards that it's gone through to show our adherence mm. to international law. I think that that's that's very key. So yes, there's this politicking happening, um, but none of that is outside of the bounds of our respect for the law, right? Mm. And our interest in upholding that and also enforcing that other people are upholding it and acknowledging they're legitimately based on their adherence to international law. So um, if my phrasing made that unclear, I, I do, I think it's really important because that's actually one of my frustration points is when I hear people um, thinking that the Department of Defense does whatever they want. It, it, it's just wrong. <laughs> right. Right. Very, very heavily inculcated with, with that sort of thing. Um, and, and it's the same for the Australian Department of Defense. But I, I'm, I'm going to move on to, um, I think, what will have to be our uh, last question. There's been um, a rich array of questions. It's been fantastic. Um, but I, I, I think I... Um, very interesting question, question that a lot of people would want to be interested in thinking about um, from Victoria, and that is, um, is there a framework in place for governance of citizens on another planet? So if we have uh, off earth human settlements, who gets to write the constitution? And that's um, from Victoria, a student. So this is the sort of question that like at space conferences when we used to go to those in the, in the before years before the pandemic um, that we would stay up in the hotel lobby drinking wine talking about right these are these sort of like fun space agey things that make it so much fun to work in this area. So I mean the first caveat here is that your citizenship goes with you right what you, you you're an American you're an Australian you're still an Australian on Mars right you're just an Australian on Mars. And so you don't create sovereignty just by arriving on another planet. Um, you, you take that with you and you are still a citizen of your nation. Now, where that starts to fall apart is an enforceability and enforceable in infrastructure, right? The, the reason that a lot of us are as loyal to our countries as we are or interested in being aligned with the country or take for granted maybe that is, is for the infrastructure and for the protection and, and for all what it means to be part of a society and part of a group. If you're removed from all of that, right? You, you don't have your police department to call when there's a problem. You don't have their fire department. You don't have your hospital or medical facilities. And it is all on this group that citizenship will, will wane, right? It, it, it kind of, I, I, this is kind of the philosophical approach, but it kind of has to at a certain point. And so I do think there's a really interesting enforceability question that, you know, you send up a group of people, say you mirror the International Space Station on another planet with a series of countries, and you write these re robust contracts about how they're going to interact with each other and what happens if somebody steals something or somebody hurts someone else. Um, who's around to enforce that contract? No, no one except for the people who were choosing to follow it. So it's only as strong as the people who are adhering to it. And it's not hard to imagine lots and lots of scenarios where that falls apart with a group of people. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and it, it's this really philosophical notion of what is sovereignty and how do you create it? 
And the other question here is, so you have a habitation and a group of individuals on another planet. They decide to abandon their citizenship and declare sovereignty. Are the planets, are the, are the countries on earth interested in defending that? Are we interested in saying, well, it's gonna take six months, but we're sending troops. And you know, you're no, you're an American. And how, how do we enforce that and whether or not there's interest in doing that? And I think that's gonna depend a lot on whether or not this is an orbiting station, whether or not this is the moon or whether or not this is Mars or whether it was something else. Um, and, and from there, you're dealing with any new nation, right? If, if they declare sovereignty and say, I'm renouncing my citizenship, we are now the United Federation of Mars. It, then it's like any new country that is drafting their own constitution and creating their own set of laws and justice and what that means to them. Um, I like the idea of people adhering to their citizenship someplace else. You know, I keep going to like Deep Space Nine and like being a kid watching Star Trek and thinking about loyalty to a species and to a concept where you're still interested in exploring and learning about other species and concepts. Um, but I also think that, that maybe that's a little naive or at least optimistic um, in terms of the enforceability of that, of people taking that loyalty with them when the infrastructure is not longer there to bolster it. Yes, yes. To, to, to provide a, an example. So I think in the best case scenario, it takes 14 minutes, I think it is, for a communication to go from Earth to Mars. That's one way. Right. <laughs> so, so, so imagine a traffic incident on, on Mars and somebody's like, uh, well, you know, I'm an Australian. I drive on the left side of the road. Um, so that's what I was doing. I was driving on the left side of the road and somebody was driving on my side of the road and, and we crashed. And so the, uh, the, there's a lawyer on, based on Earth and a judge based on Earth and they're, they're asking questions of a witness. And it takes every every question takes 28 minutes before you get the, the answer to the question. Um, that's not going to work. No. Um, and yes, Australia has some experience with being um, with being governed from a distance. And uh, eventually we decided, and, and as does the US, the same the same government involved. Yeah, it's it's history does not prove it to be a popular model, right? <laughs> and so if we look at human nature, I mean this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? You can create a method for conflict resolution that people can follow, and maybe that'll maintain collaboration, but maybe not. <laughs> And, and that's, a, that's an unanswerable question, but it's the one that we enjoy talking about at conferences the most, I think. <laughs> yes. So it has been it has been a very enjoyable discussion, very engaging discussion, very, very educative discussion. So thank you very much. I also thank um, all of the participants, especially those who have contributed questions. Thank you for some excellent questions. Um, I, I think uh, that all of my students and I think uh, other participants will have gotten a lot out of this. Um, thank you also to the US Consulate General in Auckland who, who set this up, but, but thank you especially for Elspeth for taking, taking um, some time out to, to speak to us. Um, and, uh, and thank you also for people who created the space infrastructure that make this even possible. Um, but uh, with that, um, I, I will close it there and uh, bid goodbye and thank you very much to everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for questions too. It's wonderful to know that people are listening and asking questions and engaging. It, it makes it so much more fun as a speaker. So thank you, I echo all of that and thank you so much. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stay online for a little bit because there, there may be some instructions for me um, to, to, to do, but for everyone else, thanks for participating. Um, for my students, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you again soon. Um, and thanks again to Elspeth, see you later.